ExxonMobil is the largest oil and gas business in the United States. The company has been a money printing machine in recent years. Coming out of the 2020 crash, the price of oil has since rebounded and stayed in a highly profitable range. The financial future of ExxonMobil is now secure. But what is ExxonMobil actually doing with this influx of cash? They have paid off over $28 billion of debt, built up large cash reserves, and directly rewarded shareholders. The company started a massive share repurchase program and continued paying and raising their historically great dividend. ExxonMobil is a dividend aristocrat, meaning it has over 25 years of consecutive annual dividend increases. Over the past 40 years, the ExxonMobil dividend has grown at an average annual rate of 5.9%. This has slowed in recent years, but the company is still known as a great dividend payer. In fact, it's a core position of my long-term dividend growth stock portfolio. But I'll talk more about that later. Later. Exxon's strong dividend combined with stock price appreciation generates great returns for long-term investors. So what else is Exxon doing with all this cash? They have continued directly reinvesting in the business, whether it's R&D, expanding drilling and refinery capacity, or building out their new low-carbon solutions segment. On top of this, they've used their financial strength to make major acquisitions. In July 2023, the company agreed to acquire Denbury in an all-stock transaction value valued at $4.9 billion. Just this past week, ExxonMobil announced a merger with Pioneer Natural Resources in an all-stock transaction valued at $59.5 billion. That is one of the largest M&A deals in recent history, just under Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. In this video, I will analyze ExxonMobil's latest acquisitions and share whether I think they are positive for investors. Also, I'll do an updated stock review, including the history, business model, and stock financial. Finally, the question of whether or not I will buy more Exxon stock will be answered. Let's roll the intro. My name is Zach, this is Dividend Data, and you should leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. Throughout, I'll be using the stock research tool I personally developed, which is available at DividendData.com. Here you can do deep financial analysis on over 7,500 stocks, helping you find better investments. Link in the description and pinned comment. As the great investor Warren Buffett says, never invest in a business you cannot understand. So let's take a deeper look into ExxonMobil's history and business model. The company is the largest largest direct descendant of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, which was established all the way back in 1870. You've likely learned a fair bit about Standard Oil's rise and fall as it has become a significant part of American history. To briefly review, Standard Oil quickly grew to become massively successful and dominate the oil industry. However, their tactics were often criticized for being predatory and anti-competitive. They gained control of the market through horizontal integration by acquiring all all of their major competitors. This allowed them to own 90% of the nation's refineries and pipelines. On top of this, they practiced vertical integration, creating and acquiring numerous companies at every level of production through the Standard Oil Trust. This practice streamlined production and logistics, lowered costs, and helped them undercut competitors. Ultimately, a mounting resistance formed against the company and their monopolistic practices. In 1890, Congress overwhelmingly passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, which served as the source of American anti-monopoly laws. This was universally supported and passed 242 to 0 in the House of Representatives, 51 to 1 in the Senate, and was signed into law by the 23rd President of the United States, Benjamin Harrison. Although passed, the act would not be applied to Standard Oil for a couple of decades to come. On May 15, 1911, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld a lower court judgment and declared the Standard Oil Group to be an unreasonable monopoly under the 
Sherman Antitrust Act Section 2. It ordered Standard to break up into 34 independent companies with different boards of directors. The two biggest companies were Standard Oil of New Jersey, which became Exxon, and Standard Oil of New York, which became Mobil. The seven largest of the companies ended up collectively dominating the industry, earning the name the Seven Sisters. Over the coming century, these sisters began to join together once again. In this chart, you can see how they merged over time. In 1998, Exxon and Mobil signed a $73.7 billion merger agreement, forming a new company called Exxon Mobil. This was the largest corporate merger in history at that time. In 2023, it seems like there is a new era of consolidation upon us. I'll discuss that more later. So what does Exxon Mobil's business look like today? The company has three operating segments, upstream, product solutions, and low carbon solutions. The upstream company is where it all begins for Exxon Mobil. It is the largest contributor to both revenue and earnings. This is where Exxon's geologists, engineers, and scientists work to explore and develop oil and natural gas. Upstream is organized into five businesses, unconventional, deep water, heavy oil, liquefied natural gas, and conventional. Each organization contains deep technical expertise and commercial capabilities. The second largest segment is product solutions. This is a combination of their prior chemical and downstream businesses. It makes ExxonMobil the world's largest integrated chemical, fuel, and lubricants company. Product solutions is broken up into three categories, energy products, chemical products, and specialty products. Energy products is the largest with an average of $5 billion in annual earnings from 2017 to 2023. Here they refine and sell various types of fuel, whether it's retail fuels like gasoline, commercial transportation fuels, or biofuels. Additionally, they utilize chemicals from these processes to create synthetic fibers and innovative catalysts. Chemical products is the second largest with an average of $3 billion dollars in annual earnings from 2017 to 2023. Here they utilize petrochemicals to create products used throughout society. These chemicals are used in food preservation, crop yield, medical products, hygiene products, vehicles, packaging, and so much more. Specialty products is the smallest with an average of $2 billion in annual earnings from 2017 to 2023. Here Exxon creates products out of their petrochemicals like base stocks and waxes, elastomers and resins, synthetics, finished lubricants, and new product categories which they are actively developing. Overall, ExxonMobil uses the oil and gas it produces to create fuels, chemicals, and products used throughout modern life. As of now, all these products are essential and going nowhere. Although there is a long-term concern about the growth of electric cars reducing gasoline demand, there are still massive needs for other fuels and petrochemical products. Most people have no idea how ubiquitous these products are. The following chart does a great job of giving you an idea. Oil and gas is used to create various feedstocks, basic chemicals, chemical intermediates, final products, and ultimately in end uses across many industries. They are everywhere. ExxonMobil's product solution business is poised to grow well into the future. From 2019 to 2023, annual product solutions earnings have grown from $6 billion to $11.5 billion. This assumes margins at the average rate of 2010 to 2019. They use this assumption due to the wide swing in commodity prices, which I'll emphasize later in the video. This this growth is on track to deliver a $10 billion increase in earnings from 2019 to 2027. This is a growth business for ExxonMobil and a key differentiator from many of its oil and gas peers. Finally, Exxon's third overall business segment is low carbon solutions. This is a newer business being created in 2021. The initial goal is to fund carbon capture and storage, reducing both Exxon's and their partners' emissions. Longer term, they hope they can use this captured carbon to create new products, not just sequester it underground. Outside of this, they develop hydrogen-based fuels and next-generation biofuels. As of now, the company does not yet share the financials of this business segment from what I have seen. It is not yet significant in size, but is fast growing. They view this as something which could eventually grow into a real piece of their overall business. Much of this initial investment is being accelerated by government incentives. In the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was basically just a renewable energy bill has a large incentive
incentive for carbon capture and storage. Exxon is already taking action. Last quarter, they announced that they signed a third CO2 offtake agreement with the steel producer Nucor. On top of this, they acquired Denberry, which has unique expertise in carbon capture and storage. Exxon hopes this move will accelerate their low carbon solutions business. More on that later. This should give you a good idea of ExxonMobil's current business. However, there is a major risk you need to be aware of as an investor. That is how reliant the company's profits are on the commodity price of oil and gas. This price is determined by the almighty economic principle of supply and demand. It varies over the years, sometimes at highly profitable levels and other times at money losing prices. We just lived through an extremely exaggerated version of this. In 2020, much of the world faced economic lockdowns. This dramatically reduced demand, most notably in transportation. People no longer commuted to work and plane travel was halted. With the drop in demand, there was a massive oversupply in crude oil production. Likewise, the price of oil dropped to historic lows. Companies like ExxonMobil were burning money. Naturally, the oil producers tightened up supply and limited drilling expansion. When demand returned, the price of oil surged to highly profitable levels. With that understanding, let's analyze ExxonMobil's stock from the perspective of a long-term dividend investor. To do so, I'll be using my stock research tool available at DividendData.com. Here you have all the data to properly analyze the financials of over 7,500 stocks. There is a 14-day free trial, so try it out and follow along with me as I analyze XOM stock. ExxonMobil, ticker symbol XOM, is currently trading at a price per share of $113.02. With 3.96 billion shares outstanding, the market cap sits at $447.9 billion. This makes Exxon the 14th most valuable company in the world world. As you can see, their earnings per share fluctuates massively over time. This is in line with changes in the price of oil. In 2020, the company was losing money and the stock price fell significantly. I used this as an opportunity to build my position. Since then, profits have soared with EPS hitting all-time highs followed by a similar rise in stock price. Over the trailing 12 months, Exxon has an earnings per share of $12.50. This is a P.E. ratio of 9 at current prices. However, it's important to keep in mind that earnings will not always remain at these high levels. It's already started to trend down in Q2 as the price of WTI crude oil was in the high $60 to $70 range. That drove earnings down to the lowest since 2021. Luckily, oil prices have already rebounded in Q3 and Q4, spending much of the time in the high $80 range. That level is very profitable for the company. Despite inconsistent earnings, the one constant at Exxon is their dividend payment. The forward-looking annual dividend per share is $3.64. At current prices, this gives the stock a dividend yield of 3.22%. The company has over 40 years of consecutive dividend growth. The 10-year compound annual growth rate of the dividend is 3.75%. The most recent dividend increase was 3.41%. With all the great earnings, you'd likely expect higher growth, but Exxon is being conservative. They are building up their balance sheet so this dividend can reliably grow well into the future. This is a long-term oriented company that does not care about risking it for quick profits. It has been around for 130 years and plans to be here for another 130. If we look at their payout ratio, it cycles over time. Some years it appears to be unsustainable based on the year's annual free cash flow. Other years it's very sustainable, like 2022 where it was only a 25% payout ratio. Basically, ExxonMobil manages their balance sheet to continue investing in their business and paying dividends throughout the commodity cycle. That means you don't get too excited and raise the dividend massively when the business is doing well. In fiscal 2022, free cash flow per share was $13.89. That is the highest ever for the company. 2023 free cash flow is on pace to decline closer to 2021 levels, which is still historically great. So what is ExxonMobil doing with all this cash. Total debt has declined from $69.5 billion in 2020 Q3 to $41.5 billion by 2023 Q2. That is a $28 billion reduction in total debt. Cash on hand has risen to $29.5 billion. This puts net debt at $11.9 billion. That's far from the 2020 highs of $61.5 billion net debt. The balance sheet is strong 
earning and the dividend payment is well below annual free cash flow. For context, quarterly dividends paid is around $3.7 billion. On top of dividends, they have been rewarding shares with a massive share repurchase program. This will continue as long as the company stays in this highly profitable range. However, the impact of these buybacks are about to be erased. That is due to the two massive all-stock acquisitions that I mentioned earlier. Let's dive into both of those now. To start, they acquired Denberry Inc. in an all-stock transaction valued at $4.9 billion. Under the terms of the agreement, Denberry shareholders will receive 0.8 for shares of ExxonMobil for each Denberry share. According to my research tool, Denberry has 50.9 million shares outstanding. This means ExxonMobil shares will increase by about 42.7 million shares. For context, that would dilute Exxon shareholders by approximately 1%, so it's a very minor impact. The transaction is expected to close in Q4 2023. So what is Denberry? It's a leader in carbon capture, utilization, and storage solutions. Originally, the company used its captured CO2 to inject it underground and increase oil recovery in production. The goal of the acquisition is to use Denberry's infrastructure and expertise to accelerate the growth of Exxon's low-carbon solution business segment. ExxonMobil CEO Darren Woods addresses this potential in the following clip. So if you go back in time, Denberry's business was taking the CO2 and using it to enhance oil recovery for existing wells. You'd inject the CO2 underground improve the pressure and recover more oil. With time, as, as the world's become more sensitive to the emissions and the need to actually reduce emissions, you can take that same technology and instead of enhancing oil recovery, store that CO2 underground. And so what we're buying with Denberry is 20 plus years of experience in sequestering CO2, storing CO2, uh, but also the assets that move that CO2 and the storage sites strategically located along that corridor of uh, high emissions uh, sources so that we can cost effectively capture the CO2, transport it, and then sequester it underground safely and permanently so that we're reducing those emissions from the atmosphere. In the following chart, you can see Denberry's pipeline and storage locations, which are strategically located near top emission sites. On the surface level, this seems like a great acquisition, which fits Exxon's business model. They were not done though. On October 11th, ExxonMobil announced it will acquire Pioneer Natural Resources in an all-stock transaction valued at $59.5 billion. Under the terms of the agreement, Pioneer shares shareholders will receive 2.3234 shares of ExxonMobil for each Pioneer share at closing. According to my research tool, Pioneer has 233.14 million shares outstanding. This means Exxon shares outstanding will increase by approximately 541.68 million. For context, that would dilute Exxon shareholders by approximately 13.6%. This is far more significant than the Denberry acquisition. The transaction is expected to close in the first half of 2024. So what is Pioneer Natural Resources? It is an independent oil and gas exploration and production company. This would be a sizable addition to ExxonMobil's upstream business. It more than doubles Exxon's Permian Basin footprint. They expect to generate double-digit returns on investment by recovering more resources more efficiently and with a lower environmental impact. Exxon will use its financial strength and advanced technologies to modernize and grow Pioneer's assets. They plan to accelerate Pioneer's net zero ambition in the Permian from 2050 to 2035. Let's hear from Darren Woods on why they bought Pioneer. Well, I, I think what we're talking about a deal, what we talked about is we have to find an opportunity where the combined entity offers more than any entity separately could do. So the our one plus one has to equal three equation. This deal, we've been working hard in our own business to drive technology, to drive our approaches and improvements, and then finding an opportunity to, to partner with Scott's organization, their capabilities, bringing that in, their tier one acreage, our technology, our development approach, frankly brings um, higher, higher recovery at lower cost and the opportunity to reduce emissions. And I think 
that that kind of came around just r- roughly the last few weeks as we were talking about the opportunity set. Well, I would tell you it's a, the organic opportunity set that we have, and I think I tell you the business that's growing the fastest for us is a low carbon solutions business, mm-hmm. and and it surprised people, but this transaction actually benefits our low carbon solutions business. Is it, it makes available more uh, uh, low cost, lower carbon natural gas that we can then feed into our Gulf Coast assets, feed mm-hmm. into our carbon hydrogen and ammonia plants and so it helps on the transition side we're also working with scott's team we expect to pull their net zero uh, uh pledge from 2050 to 2035 so we're going to advance getting scott's permian organization and, and mm-hmm. uh, operations down to net zero by 2035 which is 15 years better as we continue to advance ours to 2030 from a strategic standpoint the acquisition makes a lot of sense for exxon pioneer has great assets that generate sizable profits themselves If we look at PXD stock, you can see that earnings have grown in line with oil prices. 2022 annual free cash flow was a record high of $7.4 billion. However, that is now the past and like Exxon, 2023 will fall back closer to 2021 levels. Unlike Exxon, Pioneer grew its dividend and paid out virtually all the cash to shareholders. While investors may have enjoyed that, the company is financially far worse off for the future. They are down to $228 million dollars in cash on hand and barely paid off any of their debt gained from the 2020 oil crash. The company's future was uncertain, so much so that in 2019, the founder and former CEO Scott Sheffield was asked to come back to the company. It was expected that he would look for a deal to secure the company's future and allow his retirement. Here's what he had to say about the ExxonMobil deal. Hey, Scott, you are not just the CEO at Pioneer, you're also the founder. You came back uh, to run the company again, and a lot of people kind of speculated that maybe it would be you putting together a deal, uh, kind of capping off a, a, a great run with this company and what you've done. Why, why ExxonMobil? Yeah, well, obviously, um, um, over the last 40, I've been here 45 years, Becky, and I've only had two offers for the company. First offers back in 1985 when the company sold um, for about four years. And then um, Darren approached me with an offer a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is the best company uh, to take 100% stock um, in the world, in my opinion. What Darren has done with this company over the last um, few years and, and turning it around, uh, they've outperformed all the majors across all indexes. Uh, they have great potential with the Permian now becoming the uh, lar- largest Permian producer with Guyana, with uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, with all their downstream capability. It's really the best stock to own over the next several years. As a founder, you have an awful lot of, of stake in the company, a stock in the company, too. Are you going to keep the ExxonMobil shares or will you sell? No, definitely. Uh, I'm going to keep it. They have a great dividend, one of the highest dividends in the S&P 500. So I'm very excited about that. Scott wanted to find a good future home for the company. Additionally, he wanted to trade his Pioneer ownership for Exxon stock, which I would definitely agree is a good move. He traded a future of business risk and uncertain dividends for one of the greatest and most reliable dividend paying companies. The only question now is whether or not the deal will be approved by regulators. It is quite large and the Biden administration definitely does not have a favorable view towards fossil fuels. Despite this, Exxon C. CEO Darren Woods thinks it will face very little risk of being blocked by regulators. I think, uh, Andrew, uh, you know, the context to look at this deal in is the size of the oil and gas industry. And so while we talk about this being a large uh, merger, a large transaction, when you look at it in the context of the overall oil markets and, and gas markets, even if you look at it in the context of the Permian production, together, while Scott and I will have a large large business together, it would still be less than 15% of the production coming out of the Permian. So I think from a scale standpoint, uh, we're still a small player in what is a very large market. So we don't ex- anticipate any regulatory issues here. I tend to agree with Wood's analysis here. That said, it would not shock me if FTC Chair Lena Khan tries to block it. Per usual, she will likely fail. So how do I feel about these acquisitions as an ExxonMobil shareholder? From a strategic standpoint, I like it. The Denver 
Cherry one is very low risk with only 1% dilution. Pioneer, on the other hand, is quite large. When I initially read reports of a possible deal, I was not a fan. I thought they would hurt their balance sheet using cash and raising debt to make the acquisition. $60 billion is a lot of money. I thought that would be a bad move, especially in this current high rate environment. When I finally saw the deal and realized that it was an all stock deal, I felt much more comfortable. I wanted to make sure ExxonMobil kept its balance sheet strong so they could invest and pay a dividend through the next few downturns. That said, us investors will be diluted by about 14.6% in total from the two acquisitions. For context, this puts XOM stock shares outstanding to around the 2012 levels. Thankfully, Exxon's current share buyback program will aggressively fight against this and erase some of that dilution over time. Also, it's important to mention that the business itself will be larger with increased earning power. You own slightly less of a larger entity. Time will tell, but I feel good about these acquisitions and think they will be positive for the stock long term. But the question remains, will I buy more Exxon Mobil stock in 2023? The answer is no. With commodity-based companies like Exxon, I like to buy them when they are deeply out of favor. This is when you secure a long-term value. I find it too risky to buy the company at the higher end of a commodity cycle when investors actually like the company. I bought Exxon Mobil in 2020 during the depths of the oil crisis. People thought the company was going to die and it was the end of oil. Investors thought the dividend was done for. I thought they were wrong and took the other side of that trade. I made multiple videos at that time, which you can go back and watch. Currently, I have 160.62 shares of Exxon stock at a cost per share of $35.15. This has generated a total return of 221.55%. It is my best performing stock in my dividend portfolio, making up 13.6% of total value. It is my second largest dividend payer, earning $584 in annual income. From reinvesting dividends, I've earned 22.62 more shares of the company. This gives me a dividend yield on initial cost of 10.36%. I feel very comfortable holding my Exxon stock. I will continue earning and reinvesting dividends. It is a high quality company with an underrated level of engineering talent and innovation. 2023 Q3 earnings are expected to be released on October 27th. Make sure to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if this video provided value. If you want to use the research tool I've been showing throughout the video, then sign up at DividendData.com. If the software helps you identify just one slightly better stock, then it pays for itself. Thanks for watching.